Yeah, I'm Sophie. I am based, based at the Welcome Sanger Institute, working with Stephen Bentley and at the University of Cambridge, working at Hen with Henrik Solge at the Pathogen Dynamics Group. Um, and my title is essentially what Rachel just said here. So I'll be talking about trying to understand the long range movement, so migration of Streptococcus pneumonia. So first, just a bit about what Streptococcus pneumonia is. It's a gram positive opportunistic bacteria. It is human obligate, so it only resides in humans. It lives in the nasopharynx um, of both children and adults, and it can be completely asymptomatic uh, in the majority of people, really, but then can go on to cause severe disease or just local infection. So the local infection, something like otitis media, which is an ear infection, or more severely, pneumonia and meningitis. It is responsible for half a million deaths of children under five every year, and it's the leading cause of death from lower respiratory tract infection worldwide. It's endemic globally, um, but its highest prevalence is in low and middle income countries, sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. Uh, the carriage prevalence, so the asymptomatic carriage, is also highest in these places with uh, ranging from like 20 to 90% in some countries, such as the Gambia. In high income countries, the carriage prevalence is closer to 20%. Now this is typically measured in children, but the more we look in adults, the more we're seeing it. Um, and it follows the same trends with the inverse relationship to country income. So because I do use the genomes here, I'll sort of introduce what the pneumococcal genome is like. It's a 2 million base pair genome. Um, and the majority of the variation in the genome is a result of recombination or horizontal gene transfer, not from mutation. Um, so that purple line is just indicating the lineage. So there's huge amounts of variation. We have to figure out how to cluster them into lineages. Uh, we call these GPSCs or global pneumococcal sequence clusters. Um, and that's using a clustering algorithm to sort of decide what those are. I've highlighted the capsular polysaccharide locus, which is that tiny little section up there. Um, and what this does is defines the capsule that's actually surrounding the bacteria. Um, it comprises a ton of different genes. Because of recombination, those genes shuffle about and produce different antigenically distinct capsules. So here's just a nice picture of that. This is a diplococci. This is two pneumococci stuck together. And those hairs sticking out are some of the polysaccharides uh, that the immune system sees when you're infected with the pneumococcus. So as I said, it's globally endemic and it has massive diversity. Um, as part of the Global Pneumococcal Sequencing Project, we've tried to capture some of this diversity. This now comprises 26,000 genomes from over 60 partner countries. And we've classified these into over 900 lineages or GPSCs. Um, and these also comprise 100 antigenically distinct serotypes. It's actually now 101 because another one was just found. If you zoom in on a single country such as South Africa here, uh, you can see that diversity really persists. So these are the nine provinces of South Africa and the pie charts are colored by lineage. Now, just by eye and qualitatively, you can maybe see some regional differences in what lineages are present in different locations. Um, but it's hard to say if that's just a result of some kind of sampling bias uh, or if there is really geographically distinct. Here's a phylogeny on the left of those 6,000 genomes from South Africa. They're colored again by lineage. Um, and there's hundreds of years of diversity between many of these circulating lineages. So on the top, you can see GPSC5 is one of them. And in South Africa, it comprises 10 unique serotypes. Um, and on the second column there, you can see those are well mixed across the provinces. There isn't clear geographic structure. On the bottom, you see GPSC1, another one I've highlighted. GPSC1 doesn't recombine as much. And in South Africa, it only comprises G uh, serotype 19F and 19A. So all of these different lineages have sort of unique personalities, propensities for AMR, carry different stereotypes, et cetera. And um, there is a vaccine. Uh, the vaccine targets a subset of the serotypes. So in 2009 in South Africa, PCV7, that targets seven of the 100 serotypes was introduced. And in 2011, PCV13, which targets 13 of the 100 serotypes was introduced. And what happened is the serotypes included in the vaccine decreased, those blue and green lines, but the non-vaccine type serotypes expanded to fill that niche. So those are the non-vaccine types there in red. So we have a globally endemic, massively diverse bacteria. There is a vaccine, but then you have expansion of non-vaccine types. Because of the recombination, there's huge amounts of antimicrobial resistance. And um, some of these lineages that are expanding are really local. Some of them we find all over the world. Um, so the premise of my PhD has really been to understand how it spreads. Some of them spread broadly, some of them more locally. So first, can we quantify if there is geographic structure 
or if it is just too well mixed and too diverse for us to pull that out, how quickly does it spread and where does it go? Can we quantify the fitness variation between strains? And then I'll talk a little bit about the future and what I think we're missing. So to answer the first question, whether there's geographic structure, we first take the geographic location of pneumococcal samples. So say we have sample A from Eastern Cape and sample B from Northern Cape. We have the collection year of those samples. So if sample A is collected in 2009, B in 2013. We just want to know what's the probability that a pair of isolates are the same GPSC if they're collected from the same province as compared to distant provinces. I mean, I define distant provinces as provinces greater than a thousand kilometers apart. So we just count up pairs. So we count the number of pairs that are from the same province collected within one year of each other that are the same lineage over the total number of pairs collected from the same province within a year of each other. And our denominator is the number of pairs from distant provinces collected within a year of each other, the same lineage over the total number of pairs from distant provinces collected within a year of each other. And this gives us our relative risk. And we do find a 1.4 times higher risk of pairs being the same GPSC when they're from the same province. So that qualitative sort of differences that we could see on that map earlier uh, are real and quantifiable. And we can expand this and we can say, okay, rather than just from the same province, what about pairs from dis different provinces that are less than 500 kilometers apart or different provinces that are 500 to 1,000 kilometers apart? And we still find an increased risk of them being the same lineage, but as the geographic distance increases, the risk ratio decreases. So this is quantified geographic structure. So can we figure out how quickly it's spreading? We can see there's geographic structure there. How long does that take? So now what we incorporate is the divergence time between pairs of pneumococcal samples. So as I said, there's hundreds of years of diversity between many of these lineages. And here's GPSC5, which I showed you earlier. You can see the root date down there is around 1400. So that's hundreds of years of diversity. So we can break this down using software that takes the molecular clock or the mutation rate um, and turns that into real time. And we can say, okay, what about pairs that are five years divergent from each other or 10 years or 20 years and how, what's the risk of them being in the same location? So then we can say, okay, what's the risk of pairs from the same province being five years divergent compared to from distant provinces? And it's about three times higher. As we expand that distance, again, we see an increased risk of pairs being five years divergent, um, but that decreases as the geographic distance increases. And then we can flip that. So we can say, okay, at what divergence time is it equally likely that the pairs are going to be found in the same province as from thousands of kilometers apart or a thousand kilometers apart? And we find that it's not until pairs are over 50 years divergent that they're equally likely to be found in the same province as between distant provinces. So that says it takes about 50 years for a pneumo to become homogenous across South Africa. So that gives us some idea of how quickly it spreads, but 50 years is quite a long time. What's happening in that time period? Uh, we want to know where it's actually going. And everything we've done thus far is really based on the tips of the trees and the sampled locations of those tips. But what we want to know is can we infer the transmission events between tips and the missing locations of all of those events? So here we got human mobility data from what is now metadata for good. It was Facebook data for good when I started mm -hmm. um, to try and infer those events. So again, we have the geographic location of the samples. We also have the divergence time between the samples. And now what we also have is the human mobility between municipalities in South Africa. So there's 234 municipalities. This is asymmetric mobility from every location to every other location. I've aggregated this up to province level here just for ease of looking at it. We also had to get a generation time estimate. So this is the time from one person being infected to infecting the next person. This is really hard to estimate for something that is asymptomatically carried. Um, there are estimates of carriage duration. So some people carry for two weeks to two months to a year. And so we sampled from a couple of piece, pieces of work from the Gambia and Kenya um, to simulate and estimate our generation time. And we came up with a generation time estimate of 35 days that seems sensible and concordant with other work. So then we can break down our time resolved phylogeny into the number of transmission events. And every transmission event is an opportunity for mobility or an opportunity for Numo to go somewhere else. So these are our model inputs, the probability of human mobility between every municipality, the probability that each pair is separated by some number of generations. This is 35 days with a gamma distribution. 
and probability of sampling in each location. And then we estimate some parameters. We estimate uh, the probability of staying in the home municipality because Facebook people might not move exactly like pneumococcal carriers. Um, and we also estimate the infection probability by location and we use an MCMC. Our ultimate output is the probability of mobility from every municipality to every other municipality at each transmission generation of the pathogen. So it's a big 234 by 234 by number of transmission generations array. So we wanted to validate if this method was working. So we, for, we simulated an epidemic. So the black dots here are the simulated epidemic. We downsampled this, ep this epidemic based on the probability of sampling in different provinces. And then we used the downsampled data to fit the model. And in the red line, you can see we recaptured our downsampled data. And then when we exclude the probability of sampling, we actually also recapture the true data. So that makes us feel a lot better about this method working. Here you can see our real data. So this is the mean, sorry, I didn't explain that a second ago. This is the distance. So pairs that are 10 years divergent, this is the mean distance between them. 25 years divergent, this is the mean distance between them. So the plateau here is the uh, mean distance between all of our samples in South Africa. And the uncertainty represents the uncertainty in our phylogenetic tree, because the further back uh, we go in the phylogenetic tree, the more uncertain we are. We're able to recapture this pretty well. And then when we exclude the probability of sampling, this is our supposed true model estimates of the rate of spread across South Africa. And that plateaus at the mean distance between all locations in South Africa, not just of our data. So what can we do with this? Uh, we did some simulations. We simulated a sequential transmission in South Africa. Say, okay, after one year of transmission, where are we most likely to be? The black dots are the municipalities that have populations of greater than 3 million. We found that there's about a 20 times higher risk in being in being of, of being in one of these major population centers after a year of transmission, which does make sense. We then wondered what happens if we initiate a transmission chain um, in a rural area or an urban area. So on the left hand side, if we initiate the transmission chain in municipalities with populations with less than 50 people per square kilometer, you can see a lot more red. So they're just traveling, they have a much wider geographic spread. There's still the elevated risk of being in the urban centers, um, but they also travel to a lot more places. And then on the right hand side, when we initiate the transmission chains in those really urban centers, they really stay in those urban centers or move between them. And this does make sense because people that are in rural areas often have to travel a lot further for uh, infrastructure, for hospitals, for education, uh, where people in urban centers are typically better off, don't have to travel as far to get any of the things that they need. Another thing we did was just looked at the number of municipalities visited over time. Um, and you can see that it's not very many um, visited over time. It makes sense with the 50 years to spread. Uh, it obviously varies by transmission chain and where you start. So we've answered some of the questions here, but something we haven't accounted for is how migration might vary between different strains. So everything we've done sort of assumes an endemic pathogen where all strains have equal fitness. We know that's not true. We know that there's vaccination. We know that some of the strains are unable to spread as well because of this. Um, and then there's emergence of these non-vaccine types. So we wanted to estimate or quantify the fitness effect or how much better off these strains might be. So working with Noemi Lafranc, another PhD student in Henrik Salge's group, uh, we fit a logistic growth model. So we estimated the starting frequency. We estimated the growth before and after vaccination. And then we, so you can see there's two growth curves there. You have a switch year, and then you have uh, different growths before and after. Um, and so we tried to determine if the year of vac vaccine implementation was the best model fit or the year before or a year after, like how, what's the lag there? We actually estimated that the year of vaccine implementation is the best fit and we could recapture those proportions. So the lines are the model, the dots are the data. And that's the non-vaccine types, PCV7 serotypes and PCV13 serotype proportions across time. From that, we were able to quantify a fitness effect. So you can say the non-vaccine types are 1.27 times more fit than the vaccine types after vaccination. And then what we did is we incorporated this into our branching epidemic. So on the y-axis, this is the number of municipalities. 
the number of municipalities visited by non-vaccine types over vaccine types. Um, and you can see that it's not until about two years after transmission, the non-vaccine types are visiting about two times more municipalities than the vaccine types. So they are spreading more broadly. And this is inherent to the simulation framework, but it gives us some estimate of how much quicker they are spreading. So to pivot to something else uh, related to pneumo here, um, talk a little bit about antimicrobial resistance. So the x-axis here is a bunch of different pathogens, and then it's the death attributable to uh, antimicrobial resistance or associated with. And for pneumo, it's about 600,000 deaths in 2019 were associated with or attributable to resistance. Um, and it's one of the biggest attributions to AMR uh, deaths in sub-Saharan Africa. So in our South African data set, we had a look at the proportion of resistance over time. And you can see that there's a decrease there with those dashed lines of the vaccination years again. And this isn't a coincidence. The vaccine was formulated to target serotypes that did have large amounts of antimicrobial resistance. It was also formulated to target serotypes that were, were really prevalent in the United States, um, which obviously has its downsides. And there's been later valency, larger valency vaccines that have tried to address this. So I'm gonna focus on the penicillin here. So we pull out the penicillin resistance. And in the black dots there, that's the data for the overall decrease in penicillin resistance after vaccination. But when you stratify by the non-vaccine type serotypes and the vaccine type serotypes, you can see that among the non-vaccine type serotypes that are expanding, there's an increasing proportion of resistance. And so this implies that that decrease in penicillin resistance might be transient as the non-vaccine types expand. So they're 1.3 times as fit as the penicillin susceptible non-vaccine type strains. Whereas among the vaccine type penicillin resistant strains, there isn't really a change. So we've answered a lot of these questions. There does seem to be geographic structure that we can quantify in South Africa. We can also estimate how quickly it spreads. In South Africa, it took about 50 years to spread. We repeated this in Israel, it took about 25 years. And we repeated it again with an emerging lineage that had carried a large amount of antimicrobial resistance in France, and it only took about five years to spread across France. We can also see that there's preference for urban centers, and it depends on where your transmission chain initiates. And we can start to quantify how migration might vary. Um, so my next, my final couple slides are about sort of my future thoughts, but does that, anyone have any questions before I go into that? No? Okay. Maybe at the end. Yeah. Oh. So some, some of the major inputs for these models are the population sizes and a lot of our data is from children. And the dogma around pneumo is that children are the primary pathogenic reservoirs. They're petri dishes. They carry a lot of different uh, bacteria and viruses. Um, but as we're looking at adults and as we're seeing this migration and spread, they are probably contributing more to the spread than we really know but we don't know how much. And so as population sizes are growing and the age structure of different populations is changing, I'd really like to know how the age structure of a population might change transmission, invasion, and spread. And then alongside and related to that, um, there is seasonality in pneumo. Seasonality, uh, it does peak in winter months. This is sort of thought correlated with respiratory viruses, um, but looking into whether there's independent factors that are contributing to that that are climatic or even just populations moving and behaving differently in uh, different months of the year, how that might impact disease and spread. And I think neglecting these two factors in these models means they're really not robust to any future climates or demographies. It's only applicable to sort of where we are right now. And so some of the questions I'd like to address are who is driving the geographic spread? how transmission might change with changing age structure and changing seasons. And ultimately does this impact pneumonia and meningitis incidents? How is that gonna change as the population structure changes in different locations due to climate change and as we have uh, changing temperatures? And so that's all. I'd like to thank Stephen Bentley and Henrik Solge, my supervisors. I also work quite, quite closely with Jaka Karander and Hen Henry Pezenen at the University of Oslo. The South African NICD collected a lot of the South African data and the GPS consortium as well. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Any questions? 
Yes, so thank you for the presentation. It was great. Um, so I'm my expertise is on time and Andas and uh, so I'm going to yeah. And so I see that your perspective is to study um uh, potential effect of climate and how this drives the party drives control variability of the trends uh, in the future. So what kind what kind of mm, let's say lead time are you interested on? Like you have like like I will do, I will review the question. So is there interest for for some for short term predictions of um um of it or you're more interested on future trends, projections? I think anything. No one's really doing any of it. So we don't even know what is driving the seasonality at this point. Like respiratory bacteria are really neglected. We know I mean they're not. So we have pneuma, we have Haemophilus, we have Neisseria. Everyone knows those are major causes of pneumonia and meningitis. What drives the seasonality of them and how the climate might impact them? We don't know. No one's really looking. So I think first it's just trying to look back and like see what might be driving that seasonality. Mm -hmm. And then it would have to be a lot shorter term to begin with. So is there like, is there a common seasonality with um, uh, with meningitis, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. They all have some seasonality and yeah i think that they're probably linked it's probably because they're all somewhat linked to respiratory viruses but then it's hard to disentangle uh, what the impact of climate might be and especially for something like neisseria meningitis um there's a huge link with dust um there's the meningitis belt in sub-saharan africa right um but that same sort of link could exist for many of the other ones and we just don't know sure. yeah Feel um, free. We've got time to discuss. Can I ask a question? I was going to have a data security. Yeah. I've, I've never worked with data like that. So, like, how would the access to the data flow and, like, what sort of information can it provide? Yeah, so it's smoothed, firstly. So, it comes in, you have it per location. So, you have it at, at different admin levels. But if there's not enough people at an admin level, they aggregate it up to anonymize it. It's not age stratified or anything. Um, and you get it per month. One of the really annoying things is they only release it when there's a disaster. Oh, so they give you baseline data. Um, and you can assume because we're working with probabilities, probably even if people are moving less, they're probably moving to similar places. But the beginning, the initiation of them releasing this data was COVID. Right. So yeah. so then I have the data across 17 months, which kind of mitigates some of the impact of those early lockdowns. And then I also have baseline data. Um, but yeah, it's pretty annoying. It would be nice if they would just release baseline data rather than only at the time of a disaster, because what are you supposed to do with that if you don't have any reference? Yeah. Also, we yeah. Um, yeah. So and South Africa, so often people can get cell phone data. South Africa doesn't release that. A lot of countries do. I know people have it for Bangladesh, um, Thailand. Um, yeah, but at really high resolution scales, it's pretty anonymized and smooth, yeah. which makes sense, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, but it's pretty straightforward. It's just data tables, data tables. And to get access to it, you have to be associated with some kind of university or institute and request access. They want to know what you're doing. There's like whole Slack channels for it. Um, yeah, they just shifted it though, and I can't access where I had it before. So I like have everything I downloaded, but I can't get any more because they shifted where it is. But yeah, yeah. Is there any hypothesis on the link um, of climate with the uh, like development of the seasoning for carrying it to like it's it's about affecting transmission or it's affecting the one to carry? Uh, the bacteria you, you know, kind of yeah, so um, carriage is a necessary prerequisite for disease. There's a couple of serotypes that are only isolated in disease, but there's been more studies where they're actually found to be low, really low frequency. So a lot of people co-carry different serotypes, so they might be too low of a frequency to be identified. Um, as far as like climate or dust or any of that, there was a study in Liverpool that they found actually when there's higher particulate matter, there's lower carriage acquisition. And it's thought it's because you already have, you've already activated your macrophages. So they're like ready to 
grab it and remove it, but there's more damage internally from the dust particulates. So that chance of invasion or invasive disease is higher. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then another thing that it's related to is in the presence of dust, um, there's been work done in rats, really, that there's increased biofilm formation and increased, and that leads to sort of increased competence, which is like gene exchange. So if you had a lot, I don't know, a thought I have is if you had a lot of uh, pollution or air pollution, you might have a higher propensity for recombination of drug resistance. Um, but we don't really know. So there is data, I mean, like, there, there's been, like, from all those countries that we've shown in the map. Yeah. So uh, there's temporarily resolved data, like, in a year or something. Yeah, there's temporarily resolved genomic data um, spanning the vaccination period as part of the Global Pneumococcal Sequencing Project. And so as those get published, uh, they go public. But until they're published, that country has rights to that data. And nobody can do anything with it until they've published on it. Um, but yeah, it's temporarily, many of them span like 15 years um, because the whole purpose was to see what the dynamics are were pre and post vaccination as the vaccine was implemented. Yeah. How would you approach like the study plan? Would you like, like you concentrate on an area? Or would you know, you would like rather? I think to start, you'd choose a couple of countries that had very different climate climates. So some things that are closer to the equator, some things that are further away, places with more or less pollution, I mean, try and get a good variability there um, and just try and see what the link, I mean, disease would be the easiest thing to look at, um, but also maybe what lineages are, so diversity indexes, um, like population genetics, so you can look and see how, how the diversity is changing um, and how the evolutionary dynamics are changing across different climatic indicators. Yeah, these are all my thoughts, but no one's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Sure. I had a couple of questions. The first one was, because if you can come back to the part where you plug in all the information in your model. Yeah. So you don't understand properly how you plug the mobility information. You can just... Yeah, so I'm using the probability of mobility and I'm iterating across the generation times. <laughs> I don't know how... Um, so we use matrix multiplication. So we have like one generation in the first generation. These are the probable locations. Um, and then we're adjusting the diagonal. Uh, yeah, so, just, so basically, you without going into mathematics. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, you plug all these three information together yeah. in the model, and then you make generation after generation. Yeah, so exactly. So you do each generation after generation after generation, as long as you want. I think the further generations you get, the more uncertainty there is. Um, but the early ones seem to fit the data really well yeah. as well. And so that's why a lot of my simulations are really focused on the earlier years. Um, because beyond that, I become a lot more uncertain about everything, right? The divergence times, especially. Yeah. Well, you mean each generation is thirty five days on average. Yeah, but we're sampling that from a distribution okay. because obviously it's not exactly thirty five days. That's our mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's our mean, um, and that does match when we sort of plot that against what happened in Kenya, uh, Kenya and the Gambia, as well, and we only fit on the first ten pairs that are 10 years divergent. And then we use that because we're a lot more confident about that time frame. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? No. Online? Okay, well, thank you so much, Sophie. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant talk. I will... And thank you for everyone for joining online. And I will end the call then. Thanks for all listening. So you're